Hello, Bright Bible fans. This is Monica, and I'm joining you today for our next lesson in the Read Through 2020. I have to tell you that today I am um, going to be doing some painting. You are going to want some acrylic paint nearby. Now, you could do this with watercolor paint, and you could also do this with uh, colored pencils. So, whichever works best for you, I would gather those materials up. If you are un uncomfortable with acrylic paint, you definitely have options today. There's a very specific reason why I've chosen acrylic, and I'll talk about that here in just a minute. So if you're joining us for the first time, you'll find all those videos right on the units tab, along with any resources. Sometimes we do give resources. Today, I don't really have anything specific for you for resources, but um, I will make a suggestion as far as printing something out. All right, so today's lesson is in Galatians 6, and I'm going to read the first part of this lesson, and then I'm going to talk about it because I actually have another page I'd like to show you that I have already completed, and this was from 2017, so quite a while. It was just after I had got started um, in 2016 is when I started Bible journaling officially, and this was pretty early on, so January 24th is when I did this page in my other Bible and took a totally different approach that's why I want to show it to you because I think the beauty about the beauty about um, journaling God's word is that each time you go to it you can go back to that same location over and over again see something new see something in a season of life and create a whole new imagery to think about and I will tell you this page has gotten a lot of attraction and to me um, and I mean, like it's gotten people's attention as they've looked through my Bible and I've gone back to it many times because the visual there was such a powerful reminder of that message, but this is going to be something really different. So let's go ahead and read starting right off the bat, um, in chapter six, verse one, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual shall restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and, that, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. The second part of this verse goes into a verse... Um, a section of verses here that's probably very familiar and I'm going to go ahead and read it because I want to flip around and kind of talk about both. Uh, chapter 6 verse 6. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows that he will also reap. For the one who sows of his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. And especially to those who are in the household of faith. So when I was reading this passage before, this was really the section that spoke to my heart. And this is all about the reaping and the sowing. And I have to tell you that the first thing that came to my mind was the idea of mason jars because I love to can. I love to can. And I had this imagery of this. When I reap this, I get this. When I reap that, I get this. And I was thinking about in the process of canning. When we can in the process of, the, of the, the healthy fruits and we add preservatives and we, and we can it correctly, that we end up with this beautiful um, treasure of food or of sweets or whatever it might be, you know, jams or jellies or whatever it might be that we've spent our time reaping. We've, we've um, are sown and then now we've reaped this thing. But if we were to use the nasty ends the garbage, we were not to add preservatives, we were just to kind of let it be, we would end up with this jar of just yuck, and there would be nothing for us 
um, to nourish ourselves in. And so that was really the vision of this, this verse from before. It says, let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, we will reap if we don't give up. And I love that part because it encourages us to keep going no matter what. We, it's hard. Oh, man. You guys, I got to tell you, I, we have a little farm. We have a little growing farm here. And if you follow me on my regular page, you'll know that chickens are a part of my life. But I have to tell you, there is a lot of work that goes into maintaining those chickens. We grow chickens for me. And recently we had a break and we had a thief in the night. <laughs> Let's say he was a uh, pointy nose, black and white tail, uh, a little raccoon. And we didn't catch it at first. And we were losing chickens every night. And it was so discouraging. But we had to keep trying things. We had to keep going back to the grind, right? We had to, sometimes we have to weed the plant. Sometimes we have to, we have to go back to the drawing board, check the soil, add water, you know, make sure there's enough sun. We do all of this work. And if we do not give up, we end up with this beautiful fruit and we have this labor that we are so proud of. And God works through us when we're doing his work. He really does. And there are so many times that we can grow weary. Oh man, it's so frustrating, right? And we have to keep that perspective. So that's one approach to Galatians 6 that you may want to take. And I encourage you to consider doing, you know, what works for you in this verse. But there's something here more that I really want to focus on today. I think for me, it's relevant in a couple of different ways. Um, it's a very simple page. I mean, very simple. We're going to do a little bit of painting, a little bit of writing. And I, I'm curious to see where you guys will take this idea. But I really want to talk about something that's a little bit harder to take. Doing good, working through weary times, and having that positive that positive um, end result. It's, it's positive. It's, it's a, it feels good to read that passage, to be reminded, to work through this is a little bit harder. Bearing each other's burdens. Now let's just talk about this for a little bit. When we're talking in this, this passage here between verse 1 and verse 5, we're talking about Christian to Christian. Okay, We're talking about people that love the Lord, that, um, that are truly saved by His grace. They are Christians. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. When, when somebody is fallen, it is very, very uncomfortable, right? How uncomfortable it is to be put in this position that's being talked about, okay? There was a recognition here in Galatia that there were Christians that were fallen into the trap of sin. We know that even though we are saved by God's grace, that we continuously struggle, we still get into those traps, right? We still get into those traps of sin. And what if one of our fellow brothers, okay, or sisters gets fallen into a trap of sin, okay? And we can watch it and we, we see this in the church because we're full, of, we are sinners, right? We go to church not because we are perfect, not because we are better than anyone else, not because we are free of sin, but because we know that we need that fulfillment. We need those reminders. We need that accountability and we continue to be fed. We continue to grow in that. But this is a difficult situation right here. Sin is uncomfortable. Okay. I have all sorts of notes. You guys can see my notes. Sin is uncomfortable. And my question to you would be is, what do people do? How do they respond when things are uncomfortable? Do you ever think that sometimes people ignore sin because they're uncomfortable, right? Nobody wants to go to their girlfriend and say, hey, um, I'm really concerned about something with you. Nobody wants to do that. That is not an easy place to be. So sometimes we ignore problems. Sometimes we pre say, well, they're okay. They're covered. We're, we're just going to ignore that, right? Sometimes we want to destroy. And that's, I see that a lot with what we see on, on um, the internet, on Facebook, on social media. 
We just want to destroy the other person. How can she be a Christian and have that point of view? How can they say that? How can they post that picture? How can they? And we want to destroy them. We want to call people out. Sometimes we have a really difficult time letting something go. Letting it be between them and God. Okay? Letting it be done in the way that this talks about, which we're going to get to in a second. The opposite of gentleness is like calling them out. Like, you are wrong and I'm going to let you know that because this is not okay. You need to be called out. We have that that sense of attack. A lot of times we compare. When things are uncomfortable for us, we compare. And this passage talks a little bit about that. Don't compare yourself. Like, he's basically saying, you know, God tells us to cast all of our cares on him, right? But it also is, it's not contradicting. He's complimenting this. Like you want to give all your cares to the Lord. When you've got those sins, when you've got that, you repent, you give them to God, you move on, you give him those cares. But at the same time, in this circumstance, we can't forget where we are, that we too needed the blood, that we too are going to stumble. It, this is a, a matter of being a compliment to those that we love. So comparing whether the good or the bad, something that we do when we're uncomfortable, we say, well, they are a lot worse than I am. I'm not as bad as that. We also blame. When we're uncomfortable, it's easier for us to blame it on something else, to blame it on this, to make excuses for that. These are things we do when we're uncomfortable. But what is Paul Paul saying in this? He's telling us that those that are spiritually sound doesn't mean that they are holier than thou, right? They are, they are not more holy than us. They are the same. We are all sinners. But if we are a child of the king, if we are Christian to Christian, sister to sister, brother to brother, if we're in a good place spiritually, it's our job to help our neighbor. It's our job to help carry the load, not take on the load. We're not, this is not about taking on their problems getting wrapped up in their issues. And it says right there, keep watch of yourself lest you too be tempted, right? You may get into the trap of gossip or you may get into the trap of blaming or, you know, whatever. But when he's talking about bearing your own load, he's saying you gotta, you gotta take care of your own brokenness too. You have to be, you have to be able to take on what you have also with this friend and it's a matter of to me it's like that perfect picture of like the of the two I mean it ta- a lot of times we talk about yo- the yoke of a cattle as being like the marriage I'm going to start sketching here for just a minute my lettering I'm just going to do some really basic lettering in fact I'm going to go right to pen while we talk all I'm putting on this page is always be gentle because to me that's all that this is about it's about taking on each other's burdens and doing it right there the spirit of gentleness. But here's the thing. When a person is broken, when a person is struggling with sin, when when somebody is really bearing an extra load, they need to be restored. Now, cool. Look at how cool this is. Okay. I read in my commentary, which I love to read through the Greek word that's talk being talked about when they're talking about restoring is the same that was used in Mark 119 when the fishermen are mending their nets. It's also the same as someone setting a broken bone. Now, if you can imagine someone, okay, just think about this. If your friend came to you, you know, you're in the wilderness. This is going to be like, I'm going to go on a Monica rampage for a second. If you're in the wilderness on a hike and your friend has a bone that needs to be like, you're going to do it, right? You're going you're gonna to help them out. You're not going to just like leave them there. You're going to have their leg all crazy. You're going to make a splint. You're going to do something. You're going to panic and call them. You're going to do something, right? Not, you're not going to just stand there. And I think that is the thing that we struggle with so much. And unfortunately, I really truly believe that Satan loves to just use this in the negative. And I'm going to explain that to you what I mean by that. I really feel like this is what we're called to be as Christians and as 
those accountability partners, right? But doesn't Satan try to sneak in there and attack? He tries to make us feel like, oh, they are trying to tell me how to live. How dare they try to tell me how to live? And we end up putting on these this huge front. And we have such a hard time hearing what we really needed to hear, even in love, even in that total gentleness. I struggle with this, right? I, I do. It's hard to hear criticism. It really is. But sometimes it's what I needed to hear. Not criticism. It's not even criticism. It's somebody saying, hey, Monica, have you considered this? Or hey, let's pray about this. Or hey, how can I help you here? That is the type of love that we all need in our life. We need that accountability. We need that that person that's going to come up beside us and to help us bear the burden through the process to be praying for us, to do it in a spirit of love and gentleness, not by ignoring the problem and pretending that the leg, the bone of the leg is sticking out in the middle of the wilderness, not to destroy them, to bring them down, to choke them down to you need to do it this way, not to put our own, um, our own twist on things, but to do it in a spirit of love, not to compare, okay, or to call someone out because they're wrong. I see this, and this is going to hurt. This is going to hurt a little bit of feelings. I've seen this in the church. I've seen it in the church, and I've seen us judge other people in their circumstances because it's so stinking easy to do to look at someone else and say, well, I'm in a better place than them, or oh my gosh, I cannot believe they have a tattoo and they are sitting in the pew. Before. You know, I see it happening. But that's just not, not that a tattoo is sin. That was just an extreme version of Monica's thinking. But I just, I don't know. I felt like when I read this today, you know, to, to be skimming over this and to be preparing for today, I just looked at it differently. It's, I see this passage over and over again. You know, we hear talk about bearing each other's burdens, but how do we do that? How do we bear each other's burdens? Well, there, we have to have that balance. We have to do it in love and in gentleness, the spirit of gentleness with the whole goal of restoring them, not proving them wrong, not calling them out, not making them feel bad about what they've done, but truly to help them get back to who they were as a child in Christ. They've, they've gone off path a little bit, right? But we all go off path. We can't forget our own brokenness in the midst of doing this. What I've got for you here is a little bit of, it's really pretty much the same exact color. What did I just do there? I've got kind of a dark turquoise, a true green, a lighter turquoise, some white. And I'm also going to use a little bit of gold and I've got a true yellow, okay? So what I did here is I was I wanted to just be very simple and delicate and I looked up some of the world's delicate flowers. And jasmine, of all things, jasmine is considered one of the most delicate flowers because to me, I want a symbol on this page of how do I approach. I mean, I work with a huge team of, my team is growing. And I work with kids and I have a family. And we're faced with that idea, especially in the sisterhood of our team, is there's times, there's times that we have to really hold each other accountable. There's times we have to pray for each other. And I want to do this in love and in gentleness. And so this is my reminder, this beautiful jasmine flower, delicate flower. Um, Hey, what's really cool about this flower? It literally, it's a Parisian, um, wait, Persian? No, it would be Persian. This is not Parisian, like Paris. This is Persian. Yasmin. Okay, means gift from God. How cool is that? How cool is that? So I love the smell of jasmine, and it is a very truly uh, beautiful scent. I'm not a huge floral fan, like of of smells. It gets to be too much, but the smell of fresh jasmine to me is like a whole nother level of beauty. Beautiful. Okay, so what I've got here is a very basic. I'm just going straight for the paint. I did sketch a teeny, teeny, weeny bit. Okay, 
just because I wanted to have some bearings of where my, where my words were going to go. But here's why I'm using acrylic paint. If you notice, and I'm sure that you did, I've got quite a bit of action. This was actually my page from last year's retreat. We did some drawing on here. We did some um, work with uh, tape transfers. So there's a lot going on in the back. There's a little bit of shadowing. It happens. Um, I just accidentally used the wrong pen and I'm realizing that right now this pen that I use is way too heavy. Um, I meant to use my Sharpie and instead I used this guy right here which is actually more of like a Sharpie marker. So that's annoying to me because I just did that. <laughs> did not even realize it. That's okay. I don't, I don't worry. I just keep moving. But I would use a nice um, acrylic paint process if you get into a page where it's very heavy. So even though I didn't have bleed through from the backside, I could see a lot of ghosting. And so that was why I chose to do an acrylic. It's a great way to back a page without really having, I mean, you can't see the painted flower. So it's, it's really nice. You don't have to gesso. A lot of people think that they actually have to gesso their page before they acrylic paint, but they don't. The, the paint actually works as a gesso. I mean, it's basically a barrier. So what I'm going to do up here, I've got that five star flower kind of hanging on there. I'm going to come in here and also add a couple of like three pronged little flower buds. These are just really, really basic, pointy at the top, a little more bubbled down. And I'm going to add a few of these. Maybe this one's just kind of um, by itself, little buds kind of coming off of there. And I think you could have a lot of fun with this. I think you could go up um, into this a little bit more. I think I might do that. Just add one more butt up in here and um, just kind of decide where you're going to put it. I think I actually want to kind of come this way because look at how pretty that'll be if it's on the side here, kind of like a corner design, I guess is what I would say. So I'm just kind of doing these little tiny pointed with the brush, pulling it down. I've got Right now, this brush that I am using is is a, I would say, probably like a quarter inch. Let me see what it says here. It's a number six crafter's choice from Royal, which is one of my favorite brands to use with my students at school. I have to tell you that, to be honest with you, I've basically switched to only using Royal brushes at school and even myself because I really like the synthetic um, that they offer. It's they stick together very well. So they hold up amongst lots of, I'm not very good with my brushes. Like I, unless I got into painting like something professional, I probably will never use anything less than like a kid's brush because these are not, um, they're, they just hold up. I'm not gentle with my, I'm not gentle with my brushes. I got to always be gentle. I see that this is a problem. Okay. All right. Now that I have that done, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to a smaller, what would be called a liner brush. This is a really tiny brush. If you can get a tiny brush, um, you're going to be a lot more successful. A lot of the reason that painting um, kind of stresses people out sometimes is just the mere fact that they don't have a good brush or they don't have the right brush for the right job. So switching this up would be really super duper helpful. So what I'm going to start with here is actually just kind of pulling in some tiny little undersides to these little jasmines. And I am using like bright white as of right now for those, those first layers of jasmine because, um, I just didn't want to get too detailed yet. I'm just kind of placing things where they need to be. And part of our jasmine um, really has some pretty decent sized greens. In fact, a lot of times the greens are almost as big as the little bud. Jasmine tends to be lots of small flowers kind of grouped together. And as I've got these, I'm kind of uh, placing a couple of these bigger greens in here. What I'm going to do is while this paint is wet, okay, this is important. I'm going to just bring in a little bit of turquoise and even maybe a little bit of yellow 
and just switch things up. I mean, this is like picky painting, but I just like having more than one color there. So little streaks of different colors is always good. You can always add in more as it dries too, but if you want it to blend a little bit, you can switch up and have a few extra colors. Okay, so what I've got here is a little bit of gold paint and I'm mixing it with white because basically what I want, it's not about the gold necessarily as it is that I just wanted something light. I could have used even like a dark gray blue and mixed it with the white. I just want something to give me a little shadow. So I'm just looking for a tiny bit of dimension on these petals and what I'm kind of focusing on is which petal is overlapping the other and I'll just kind of pull that out from there. So I'm going around the edge then I'll use the white to smear it out. This is a good time to sometimes use your finger. <laughs> I love to paint with my fingers. It doesn't have to be everywhere but certainly just a little dimension helps for you to see the flower to see you know a little bit of depth or movement. If it's just that one plain color it gets to be a little bit lost. So we'll do something like that. So now that we've got that going, we can go back in there and add any details that we want. I really would like to use a little bit more of this turquoise now. I know more, more or less just using it for some variety and color, just like I did that, um, that golden tan. <laughs> details here. I love how that turquoise is just kind of brightening those petals up a wee bit. Of course if you do too much you can always go back in there with the original color and pull those out just like I had to do there for a minute. Shape it and then once you have that done the last part that we're really going to do here on this particular flower and you know there was I could have really done um, some background color in this is this too so if this is a page that you're catching the replay or you're catching or you're going to be painting later you know having some color on the back of your page is going to help to pop that flower out but I really truly did just want to keep this as simple as possible today um, sometimes I think we get ourselves so carried away with you know layers and this and that that we sometimes lose the beauty of just the simplicity of uh, just a simple thought a simple comment a simple reminder that we might need so what I'm doing here is actually using a true bright yellow and I'm giving myself some dots here in the middle and once this is dried what I'll use is a, is a pen and just kind of pull those down um, I'm really should have looked up the, the I haven't I haven't practiced my my science in a while so I'm not exactly sure um, that's like the little pods of pollen right that's what they're called pods of pollen <laughs> that's what I'm calling them in fact you know what I think I'm going to do here just so you guys can see what I'm talking about is to actually grab just the teeniest bit of brown if I can find it and I think you could just have such a fun time um, painting all over this really like you could have this whole page just filled with jasmine It'd be beautiful just that clean white and bright so just pull a little bit um, I like to water my paint down, even though some people that do use acrylics, they would rather you see 
see you using like a gel medium. I do use water. Um, either will work. Sometimes I just use the difference between what would be like a true acrylic and more of a craft. And if you have a craft white or a craft, the color that you're using, um, they just tend to be a little bit thinner. And so you can pull those lines a little bit easier like I'm doing here. So just kind of eyeballing those into the center. They don't even have to be super perfect. They just more or less, it's more of a... Um, implied I guess you could say now I think what I'm going to do because I really do I want to maybe highlight this a little bit more around the edges I think what I'm going to do here is actually take this this is going to be an experiment I'm going to take my turquoise and I'm going to water it down to almost the point of being like watercolor so if you see I'm just pulling this together now the thing about doing this is you're going to get a little bit more coverage so if you're not a big fan then then use watercolor, right? But I'm gonna just take that little tinted bit of paint. It will cover slightly more opaque than a true watercolor would be. And you can see it's gonna be a lot of water. So it, it's gonna turn dark where I'm at. But thinning that out will give you just a tiny bit that you can highlight around your flower area and even into your words if you want to. And this is something you can do here at the end, or you can also do it before because the nice thing about acrylic, remember, you are painting over something. So you're actually going to be covering up those words. If that's too scary, then you want to use watercolor for this whole thing and just kind of avoid your flower. So yet you're like, Monica, how do you paint a white flower? Well, you don't. You just kind of paint around it. So that would be you know, another option. The other thing would be um, to use colored pencils. And then you really could try to use some white because the pages of your Bible are typically an off white. And so that will give you a little bit of brightness anyway um, to work with. There's our little painting lesson for the day. And I hope that you enjoyed every bit of that and have a wonderful week, guys. See you then. <laughs>